Feigl has been with us at least a hundred years. Gatherings to show off the latest designs are not new either. Today's bicycle still employs the same principles as great-grandfather's machines. Chain drive is very efficient mechanically, so we lose little power translating muscle energy into propulsion, which does as well when your source of power is as limited as a human body. Just how efficient we can measure in the laboratory. Phil here is effectively cycling up a long slope at a steady speed. By comparing the amount of fuel he uses when cycling up the hill, to that he uses when running up the same hill at the same speed, we can calculate how much more efficient the cycling action is. We can't measure the fuel consumption directly in, for instance, sandwiches per mile, as Phil's fuel is already dissolved in his body. But we do know that there is a fixed relationship between the quantity of oxygen used to burn up that fuel and the amount of fuel used. So by measuring Phil's oxygen consumption, we can calculate his fuel consumption. And we find that when Phil runs up the hill, he uses about twice as much oxygen as when he's cycling up the same hill. So the continuous action of pedaling is about twice as efficient as simply running. But on a flat road, the difference is even greater. Just think about the effort of cycling 50 miles and compare that with running two marathon races put end to end. But the next problem for human-powered vehicles is literally a drag. To demonstrate this, we've put Duncan Laurie into a wind tunnel with a wind of 25 miles per hour blowing into his face. The smoke trail shows how the air is moving past Duncan and his bicycle. Once the flow is disturbed, its pressure drops, so the smoke spreads out, showing the low pressure turbulence behind him. This pressure difference literally pulls Duncan back and absorbs his precious muscle power. I can feel a, a large pressure build up in my face. You can see the higher velocity, lower pressure region behind in the smoke trail. I have to make good that pressure difference with muscular energy. How much energy goes into overcoming air resistance at 25 miles per hour? In the region of 90%. Short, blunt objects will always cause this problem. And one has to add a fairing to improve it. And this is Duncan's solution. Underneath the skin, it's essentially tricycle. Still chain driven, but with the driver reclined to reduce the overall height. It looks very professional. Not surprising, as Duncan works at the Canfield College of Aeronautics. We've now um, dealt with the problem of pressure loss. You can see the flow nicely attached everywhere. So the remaining problem now is mechanical losses due to friction and tire flexing, plus the skin friction of the airflow on, on what is now a larger surface than, than a normal bicycle would have. To do 25 miles an hour, it now requires about half the effort that we, we was necessary on a conventional bicycle. It is surprisingly difficult to calculate an optimum shape because most available research is directed to the problem of high-speed aircraft in clear air and not at vehicles operating at low speeds close to the ground. As a result, no one has yet found a definitive answer, so a variety of shapes are still being tried. Most builders of human-powered vehicles do not have access to high-tech facilities. Phil Webster and his father David are typical. Wind tunnels and the like do not abound on the moors above the village of Howers in West Yorkshire. So their machine is built in the garage. But it's no less sophisticated for that. The chain drive is about all it has in common with a conventional tricycle. The front wheels are both driven and they are steered by this joystick. The body is simply a glass fiber shell. The lightweight chassis just drops into it. Completed, it's an elegant device and effective. They too have adopted the reclining posture, not only to lose height, but also because pushing the pedals harder 
merely pushes you into your seat, rather than tending to lift you off it as on an ordinary bicycle. It's not so much a jet set as a chain gang that's gathering here. The streets of Monaco may annually reverberate to turbocharged Grand Prix cars, but for pedal power, the boulevard de Milton Keynes will do very nicely. This is what is billed as the largest assembly of human-powered vehicles in the world, the Zappel Festival of Human Power. 150 international competitors meeting to push the frontiers of human-powered achievement forward just a little bit further. A series of challenges awaits the competitors. Short and long circuit races, practical tests, and a high-speed 200-meter sprint. Not just for glory either. The prize fund tops 8,000 pounds. For some, it's become more than a hobby. These wind cheater machines are manufactured at a factory in Norfolk by Mike Burrows. Our commercial machine is even more difficult to design. It means you have to think about every single item because your power input is obviously very, very limited. There's no way you can tune it up other than training. Uh, so you have to look at every single aspect, the drive, efficiency, bicycle chain is still clearly the best there, your gears, um, your wheels, your tyres, and primarily the aerodynamics in our case, that that's the single most important factor, certainly on the very fast events. And they, they have to be right, not just good. I mean, motor cars are, are really quite disgusting boxes. I mean, they, they, they can't avoid being. They're very short and dumpy and everything. We, we, we're just ten times better and have to be if we want to win the, the, the serious events. And this machine does extremely well in the serious events. It's called a poppy flyer, designed and built in Norfolk by Mick Wardby and Alan Young. It holds a record as the fastest European human-powered vehicle at 49.89 miles per hour. This, is, this has been solely designed to go as fast as possible. And there are no utilitarian motives or anything else. Now, there are two problems, as we've, we've had before. The first one is how to, to match the muscle power uh, to the road wheels. And they have this absolutely gigantic uh, sprocket chain wheel. It's got 140 teeth, and which is geared to an ordinary sprocket um, for, for the driving wheels in the front here. But um, one revolution, the highest gear, one revolution of the chain wheel, propels this vehicle no less than 32 feet. Whilst the racing bicycle, even with a high gear, uh, will only go about eight feet. So it's clearly designed to go very fast indeed. So um, the first interesting feature is therefore this matching device of getting muscle power into the machine. The second one is that they've solved rather ingeniously the problem of having front wheel drives with its advantage of having a short chain with the ability uh, to steer as well. You can see I, I, I can move this wheel here. And this has been achieved by having a stationary set of sprockets and a universal joint uh, between uh, the sprocket drive and the wheel itself. So this allows limited, limited movement of the wheel without interrupting the drive. Now I think this, is, this, this unit here, this long, really is the heart of the machine. This is where the planning stops and the pedaling starts. The object of the sprint is simply speed, to be fastest over a 200 meter stretch of this dual carriageway.